This is Dr. Uh, Mohamed Allo. Today we're going to be talking about uh, stress testing. This comes up a lot. There's a lot of questions being asked about this. So it's a very, very simple concept. Um, the most important thing is that every st stress test comes with three basic parts. There's an EKG portion that everybody gets. There's the actual stress uh, portion of the test. And then there's um, imaging. Not all stress tests come with imaging, but some of them have to. And we'll go into all of these. So first of all, what is the point of a stress test? The point of a stress test is try to uh, produce ischemia. We want to see if there's anything we can do uh, to reproduce ischemia. Uh, and the point of a stress test is to um, find out if somebody have, has significant stable coronary artery disease. Keep that in mind. It's significant stable coronary artery disease. Now significant is defined as usually lesions within your arteries um, that are about 450 uh, or 60 percent. Now remember we don't stent anything unless it's over 70 percent and the point of this whole test is to try to find out if there are any lesions of about 50 or 60 uh, percent. So we try to produce ischemia by increasing demand. There are lots of ways of increasing demand on the heart and we try to figure out if there are any blockages um, in your arteries. Um, so the stress part of the test is two forms. The best form is exercise. It increases your heart rate, it causes dilation, and we get to know what your functional capacity is. Functional capacity is the best predictor of uh, clinical outcomes. If you're able to complete a test and get to that 10th or 11th minute, the likelihood of you having a, an acute uh, event like a heart attack or a stroke in the next year is just a fraction of a percent. So the best predictor of how well someone is going to do uh, from a stress test is not really any of the other stuff, but more so um, how long they last on the treadmill. So that's very, very important. Um, vasodilation with exercise, if we strain your heart by making your heart rate go higher and higher, um, your arteries will dilate and more flow will get to your heart, and that's kind of how it works. So pharmacological uh, stress testing, if you look at this here, um, we have two basic drugs we can use. Uh, one class is vasodilators. Um, like adenosine, persantine, diprimidol, other vasodilators we've used in the past. And then there's another drug called dobutamine, which basically just increases your heart rate. So neither of them, um, exercise does both of those, but neither of those two do what exercise does. Exercise increases your heart rate and vasodilation, whereas in the case of adenosine, it just vasodilates you, and dobutamine just increases your heart rate. So how does this cause ischemia? Um, so if you look at this pretend artery here, you got the large branch at the top. It branches down into two medium-sized uh, vessels. If you have a plaque, like over here on the left, and, you, and, and you're running around doing your day normally, um, those arteries or those small vessels after that plaque are already maximally vasodilated. So if we strain you or give you a vasodilator, and suddenly the other artery here that's open uh, all of a sudden vasodilates, that will cause stealing of blood flow from the one side to the other. So blood will flow from this blocked up artery over to the newly created bed that's in a lower flow uh, area. So the blood will automatically shuttle or shift, they call it coronary steel syndrome, blood will automatically go to the other side, thereby producing abnormalities uh, on the uh, uh, part on the uh, imaging part of the stress test. Um, so that's very important to understand. It all works by vasodilation. If if you have a stable plaque there, you're already maximally vasodilated distal to it. And then when we when we create ischemia or stress you, the other side dilates and sucks the blood away, and that causes a lack of blood flow to that one side. So imaging comes in two basic uh, forms. Uh, the most common form is nuclear imaging. Basically, we inject you with a uh, nuclear tracer that your heart views as oxygen. Your heart pulls this up, it's bound to, it, it thinks it's oxygen, and the, the, the heart muscles light up. After we stress you, we inject you with it again and uh, see if, you're, if the same areas light up. If certain areas don't light up, then we know that blood is being stolen from those areas to another area, and we call that a reversible defect. The main thing we're looking for is reversible defects, or they, they call it ischemia. That's the ischemia uh, that we're looking for. Um, the other way of doing imaging is echo. Uh, doing uh, an ultrasound on your heart, looking at all the walls at rest, and then making you run or speeding up your heart rate, um, and, and then rechecking the walls and seeing if any of them stop moving. If there's blood not getting somewhere, the wall will get um, 
slower and uh, not move as well. So that's mainly what we look for with an echo. Now there are different possibilities. If you look down to this section here, you could do an exercise only stress test where everyone, you just hop on there, get an EKG, you run on the treadmill as long as you can while we monitor your EKG. Um, there's an exercise nuclear where you, we make you run, we do nuclear imaging, we can do an exercise echo where you run and we do an echo on you. We could do adenosine nuclear, um, which is a vasodilator. Those always have to be with nuclear imaging. You can't just do vasodilation on its own. Um, you could do dobutamine, speed up your heart rate with echo and or nuclear. Um, so those are all the different possibilities. One thing I will say about the EKGs, um, you have to really look out for lead V5. Lead V5 is where you're going to see the ischemia. Now ischemia, um, remember, is um, global ST depressions. We've learned from stress testing that when someone's ischemic, the ST depressions do not localize. They don't go to just the inferior leads or just the anterior lateral leads. Um, if somebody's truly ischemic, you'll see global ST depressions. And I will say that V5 uh, of all the leads is the one that's the most uh, accurate. The inferior leads actually carry the most false positives. If somebody just has inferior uh, ST depressions, that's more likely a false positive um, than anything else. So that's a little bit about stress testing. Now that you know how stress testing is done, um, the next section I think that's the most important is we decide who do we stress test. How do we know which patients we should send for a stress test? If we just did a cath on somebody, can we stress them the next day or a day later or a week later when they come back? So it's very, very important. So the most important thing to do is to look at a person's pretest probability of actually having coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. Um, the, the, you divide them up into three basic risk categories. You have a low risk patient, a high risk patient, and an intermediate risk patient. Now the low risk patients are these people they're usually young people, never smoked, had a little bit of chest pain, um, and, and we're trying to, and, and we basically say that their chance of really having coronary artery disease is about 5%. Um, then the, the, the uh, high percentage group, or the high risk pre probability group, is those that we know for sure they, they have coronary artery disease. They've already had bypass surgery, they already had carotid endarterectomies, peripheral artery disease, they have all the risk factors. They may have even had a heart attack or two in stents. So we know without a doubt that they have coronary artery disease. The question is, is there anything significant or new going on? Um, that not, and, and we usually say their pretest probability is about 90%. That we know for sure they probably have something. Now let's say they've never had an MI or stroke or anything. These are your people that are morbidly obese, 60, 70 years old, um, hypertensive, low HDL, high LDL, smoke their whole lives, and have uh, you know multiple other risk factors. Those those ones, without a doubt, we could probably say have a high likelihood of having um, coronary artery disease. The next group is your intermediate risk patient. These are the ones with a with you know it's a flip of a coin. Um, they they may have it, they might not. They're they're middle aged. They're you know between 40 to 60. They have a few risk factors. Smoke maybe didn't really smoke a lot. Uh, but we're not really sure. Their chest pain sounds uh, pretty real, but it's a flip of a coin. 50% chance they either have it or they don't. So those are the ones we call intermediate risk. So if we look at now our, our uh, positive predictive value for a low-risk patient, if you took these low-risk patient people who are between 0 and 25% chance of having coronary artery disease, let's just say 5%, you know, just to lowball it. We take a 20-year-old, put them on a treadmill, they fail, so the, the test is positive. If you look at the positive predictive value, it only goes up to 21%. So you go from a 5% pretest probability chance of having coronary artery disease up to 21%. So that's not very good. If you take a high-risk patient, you put them on a treadmill, this guy who's already had stents and heart attacks, um, his positive, his um, Pretest probability of having uh, coronary artery disease is 90%. A positive predictive value uh, with the test done um, goes up to 98%, um, which is pretty good. If you go from 90% up to 98%, uh, that's pretty good. If the test is negative, it drops to 83%. So it doesn't really help us. So we're going, if we take a patient that's high risk, we take them at 90%, it goes up to 98. If it's positive, it drops down to 83. We're still pretty sure they have coronary artery disease. So it th th really doesn't matter. Um, it's kind of a waste of time to do a patient um, that's really high risk um, or, or high, high probability, I should say. Um, so these patients, you know, 80% chance or higher that they that they have it. And if you do a test and it's positive, it goes up to 98%, which we already kind of knew anyways. So it's the intermediate risk patients that you really, really uh, want to test because an intermediate risk patient is between 25 
to 75% or we set a flip of a coin right at 50%. 50% chance they have it, 50% they don't have it. So if it's positive, that 50% jumps up to 83. If this intermediate risk patient who we weren't sure about, flip of a coin, is positive, the, po the positive predictive value goes up to 83%. That's pretty good. If it's negative, um, it drops to 36%. So going from 56 from 50% down to 36%, this is a really, really good test. This test can take us from, it's a flip of a coin to the 83% chance they have it or 36% chance they have it. So it's a really, really good test. It could easily rule in uh, or rule out um, who has it and who doesn't. And remember, stress testing is to test for significant stable coronary artery disease. I remember one time, um, we did a cath on a guy two weeks ago, comes back in with chest pain, his coronaries were clean two weeks ago, and they're asking us, do you want to stress him? Well, a stress test looks for stable, significant coronary artery disease. We just did a cath on him, and it showed nothing. He had no coronary artery disease, so the, a stress is not going to change anything. If he had an acute plaque rupture or, rupture or an acute MI, his troponin would be positive, and that's why we have troponins. But taking a person who was just cathed uh, and was completely negative, and stressing them is not going to help us because if it if it's positive, he would have something. The only thing that could be positive in him would be an acute MI and acute plaque rupture. So his arteries are not going to change in two weeks. You don't grow atherosclerosis or plaques overnight. It's it takes week it takes um, years like two to three years or four or five years even. Um, so in in that case, it was kind of a a waste of a, a question and a waste of time. There's no reason to stress anybody if they just had a cath. Um, that was perfectly clean because you're looking for stable significant coronary artery disease and the cath was clean and showed that they didn't have any uh, significant coronary artery disease. That's all for today. Um, I hope this explains stress testing a little better. Uh, please feel free to find me on the website or on the internet, ask me questions um, or discuss this. Thank you very much and thank you for listening.